Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers right now on Morning News Now. Consequences of war, pressure growing on Russia to end the violence in Ukraine. This morning, the United Nations weighing whether to remove Russia from the Human Rights Council amid mounting evidence of war crimes. There's nothing less happening than major war crimes. Responsible nations have to come together to hold these perpetrators accountable. We have team coverage with the latest developments, including a new round of sanctions aimed at Russia's economy and President Vladimir Putin's family. History in the making. Senate lawmakers set to vote today on the confirmation of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson on track to become the first black woman on the Supreme Court. We'll break down what to expect. Masters plan. It's tea time for Tiger Woods, the golf great, back on the green in Augusta just one year after a devastating car crash. More on the excitement as the Masters tournament gets underway. And finally, heroic, a heartfelt thank you for a group of firefighters who saved an entire family as flames ripped through their home. The harrowing rescue and the emotional reunion. It's a really great story. You'll want to stick around to see. Definitely. As is Tiger Woods. Yeah, that's the one I'm keeping an eye on. I, I mean, unreal. Blown away. Unreal. Yeah. And, and just not easing back in. Like, let's just do the masters. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, I'm going to win, yeah. obviously. And it's just amazing. All right, we'll get into that a little bit later. We begin, though, with the war in Ukraine, where there are louder calls by the country's leadership for more help from the West in the face of an expected Russian assault on the eastern part of Ukraine. NATO foreign ministers are meeting today in Brussels, and Ukraine's foreign minister will be there. They are expected to discuss additional military support as Ukraine's top diplomat urgently pleads for more weapons. On Wednesday, a Pentagon official said all Russian forces have now withdrawn from Kiev's suburbs and surrounding towns. The atrocities discovered there could lead to Russia's suspension from the U.N. Human Rights Council. Members will vote on that this morning. This all comes after the U.S. and E.U. announced new sanctions against Russia. In a speech yesterday, President Biden outlined the measure, saying the U.S. and its allies are going to ratchet up the pain for Putin. First, the United States will impose full blocking sanctions on Sparebank, by far the largest financial institution in Russia and Alpha Bank, its largest private bank. We're locking down any accounts, any funds that those banks hold in the United States. They'll not be able to touch any of their money. They'll not be able to do any business here. And second, I'm going to sign an executive order that's going to ban any new U.S. investment in Russia. We've got a team standing by to bring you the latest. In a few moments, you're going to hear from NBC News military analyst Colonel Jack Jacobs and our senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. But before that, let's head straight to the Kiev suburb of Irpin, where we're joined by NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez. So, Gabe, Ukraine's President Zelensky didn't seem too impressed with this latest round of sanctions by the U.S., by the EU. So what is it he was hoping for and what kind of support could we then see from NATO today? Uh, hey there. Good morning, Joe. Well, as you mentioned, President Zelensky says he wants more weapons and tougher sanctions against Russia. Just listen to Ukraine's foreign minister speaking at NATO headquarters earlier today. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons and weapons. We are confident that the best way to help Ukraine now is to provide it with all necessary to contain Putin and to defeat Russian army in Ukraine. I call on all allies to put aside their hesitations, their reluctance to uh, provide Ukraine with everything it needs. Because as weird as it may sound, but today weapons serve the purpose of peace. The Ukrainian government says that the European Union has spent 30 times, 35 times more on Russian energy since the start of this war than it has on weapons sent to Ukraine. Mm. Joe. So, Gabe, as we mentioned earlier, defense officials says that Russian forces have now totally pulled out of Kiev suburbs and the northern town of Chernihiv. We saw the destruction left behind and those shocking images of, of atrocities in Bucha. There's a vote this morning to suspend Russia from the U.N. Human Rights Council. How significant is this vote? Is it more symbolic or could it actually have deeper consequences? 
Well, Joe, would require two-thirds of the Human Rights Council to suspend Russia. And the body's decisions uh, actually are not legally binding, but they can at times have po important political consequences. So that remains to be seen. But you mentioned those Kiev uh, suburbs. We're in one of them right now, Rapine. And I want to show you just a little bit. This is actually an apartment building that was shelled at the beginning part of this war. So we step over this glass here. You can see the blast wave shattered the windows here. One of the apartments on the top floor, actually several of them, were destroyed by this shelling. Thankfully, most of the residents, if not all, had actually managed to evacuate this building just hours before the explosions. We spoke with one resident this morning who was returning here for the first time. He is very thankful he got out of here alive. Yeah, Joe. no kidding. That is a lot of destruction there, Gabe. Well, we have you. I do want to ask you one more thing about another part of the country. Yesterday, the Red Cross has evacuated more than 1,000 people who fled Mariupol on their own, moving them to a neighboring town. Today, Ukraine says 10 humanitarian corridors are open, but again, civilians are going to have to make their own way out. So what is the latest in that city and really the eastern part of the country where we know Russia is now focusing its attack? Uh, yeah, Joe, and that is extremely significant. You mentioned there that residents will have to make their own way out. That is easier said than done. Even though these humanitarian buses are coming to this area, they still have to find a way to make it out. But the latest from Mariupol is, sounds very dire. Local officials say that more than 100,000 people in that city are still in urgent need of evacuation. The local uh, mayor says that more than 5,000 people have been killed, including about 210 children, although those numbers are impossible to verify. But yes, as you said, Russian forces now appear to be focusing their efforts on the eastern part of the country. So residents from that area are being urged to evacuate immediately from the Donbass region, also from places like Kharkiv. But also there is significant concern in the south in places like Mariupol and also nearby Mykolaiv where shelling in, is intensifying at this hour. Yeah. Joe. Gabe Gutierrez standing amid shattered glass and so much devastation in Irpin. Gabe, thank you so much. Now I want to dig into those new sanctions targeting Russia's top financial institutions and members of Vladimir Putin's inner circle, now even members of his family. Here's President Biden on the impact he believes sanctions are already having on Russia. Together with our allies and our partners, we're going to keep raising the economic cost and ratchet up the pain for Putin and further increase Russia's economic isolation. The steps we've already taken are predicted to shrink Russia's gross domestic product by double digits this year alone. Just in one year, our sanctions are likely to wipe out the last 15 years of Russia's economic gains. Let's bring in NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, good morning. Thanks for being with us. So walk us through these new sanctions. What do they add to what's already been in place? Good morning, Savannah. We have seen a series of sanctions over time. And part of what is new in this tranche of sanctions is that it gets personal. Included among those sanctioned are two of Vladimir Putin's daughters. And very little is known about his immediate family uh, in general terms. But what U.S. officials know is that they believe that Vladimir Putin has been able to use family members to hide some of his wealth. So his adult daughters who live abroad are among those sanctioned also looking at some of the close figures in his government. Some names we know, like the former president, Medvedev, he is among those, and, and some of the other top officials in government and their spouses. Also looking at some key financial institutions, looking at a ban of U.S. investment in the country, as if that hadn't already begun because we've seen so many U.S. corporations pulling out, but making that a more formal thing. Mm -hmm. And so really looking at additional ways to constrict the financial capabilities of Russia. And the American approach to this, along with allies, has been to keep stepping it up, hoping to put more pressure not only on the Kremlin government, but on influential figures in Russia who may be able to have some influence on their government, but also to grind down the financial capabilities of the Russian society. And that's what you heard the president talking about mm -hmm. with the shrinkage of the GDP. They think maybe 10 to 15 percent of the Russian economy could be directly affected by this. And Kelly, a piece of this puzzle, of course, when you talk about those people who are important within the country, important to President Putin, the oligarchs. I want to play some of what President Biden had to say about taking aim at them. Think about the, the incredible amounts of money these oligarchs have stolen. 
These yachts are hundreds, millions and millions of dollars. Look, these oligarchs and their family members are not allowed to hold on to their wealth in Europe and the United States and keep these yachts worth hundreds of millions of dollars, their luxury vacation homes, while children in Ukraine are being killed, displaced from their homes every single day. So, Kelly, we've heard a lot about yachts. We've heard a lot about private jets. Tell us what the White House believes this effect will have and what we know about the individuals who are being targeted. Well, it has both a sort of uh, optics effect and it has an actual value effect. When you look at the cost of some of these assets, uh, it is a substantial value to those who own them. And so there should be an economic pain associated with it. But it also sends the message of the luxury of the elite lifestyle being attacked here as a penalty for what is happening. You heard the contrast in what the president was saying. We're seeing civilians who were simply living their lives up until February 24th when this war began, unprovoked, innocent people who have been killed, maimed, their lives destroyed by this, and wanting to exact a price on those who have been otherwise able to enjoy the luxuries of Russian society, the mm. oligarchs who have benefited from uh, the Kremlin uh, aristocracy. And so it has a, a smaller, perhaps, in the overall picture effect, but it also has kind of a visual punch as well. And those are the people who have levers of power mm. against Putin or with Putin uh, in his in kind of the world in which he lives. And that yeah. they hope is is another lever as well. Savannah. Mm. All right. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. So what more should the United States do to stop the war in Ukraine and to hold Vladimir Putin responsible? NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell put those questions to Secretary of State Antony Blinken in this exclusive interview. The horror the Russians left behind prompting cries for justice as America's top diplomat rallies NATO to brace for a long war. President Biden has called Putin a butcher, a war criminal. You have said that the people responsible for the crimes in Bucha and those who ordered them will be held accountable. That's right. How can that happen without Vladimir Putin standing trial? The wheels of accountability can move slowly, but they move. And someday, some way, somewhere, uh, those who committed these crimes and those who ordered the crimes uh, will be held accountable. President Biden got personal, sanctioning Putin's two adult daughters. Their family members are not allowed to hold on to their wealth in Europe and the United States while children in Ukraine are being killed, displaced from their homes. Their images from Bucha, uh, as you describe it, the atrocities. You have small children. What do you tell your children? What would you tell them? Well, thankfully, they're, they're too small to actually see that, be able to digest it. And, but someday and they'll, they but will. Some, but someday they will. You ask yourself, what if this was happening in my town to my kids? to my family. I think it only reinforces our determination to, to bring this to an end as quickly as possible. But President Biden is not punishing other countries helping Putin by buying his oil. Why aren't we sanctioning China and India? These sanctions are having a dramatic impact. But there are big loopholes. No. And Europe still is buying there, natural gas and still will for are, another year. There are loopholes that piece by piece, one by one, we're trying to close. Sometimes that takes time. Time the Ukrainians don't have. Andrea Mitchell, NBC News, Brussels. Let's bring in the NBC News and MSNBC military analyst, Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, thanks for being with us this morning. So let's pick up right there with what Andrea was just asking. This next round of sanctions, the U.S. and Europe planning for Russia. There is this cutout sort of still going on with Russian oil being sold in various places. Do these sanctions right now go far enough to really punish Russia for specifically these war crimes, for what we've seen happening around the capital of Kyiv? Do you think the West is holding out on banning Russian energy in case Putin escalates this conflict even further? Is that like another carrot that we have? Or what do you think is happening with that? Yeah, I think that's probably the calculus. I mean, the whole idea of sanctions was... Uh, was brought up at the very beginning of the war, and some were arguing, and quite persuasively, that we needed to uh, put sanctions on Russia, put them all on Russia, and everybody we could find in Russia, and do it right away. But there, there were two arguments against it. One was that if they didn't work, what's plan B? Uh, and the second argument was came from our allies, who were still reluctant to disengage from uh, supporting Russia through the purchase of its energy. Even now, uh, uh, Europeans are still 
as you heard, paying three times more for Russian energy than they're contributing to mm -hmm. Ukrainian weapons. Unless that changes, the Ukrainians, particularly now with the war on the ground changing dramatically, the Ukrainians will be, ex it'll be extremely difficult for them to defend themselves. Now, Colonel, we heard in our colleague Gabe Gutierrez's report, he played some sound from the Ukrainian foreign affairs minister who said, weapons, weapons, weapons. That's what we need. We did get some news out of Congress last night when they unanimously passed legislation to revive what's called the Lend-Lease program that was used during World War II. It's intended to expedite the delivery of military equipment to Ukraine. Do you think that equipment, do you think this step helps to adequately prepare Ukraine to face off against what we might see, what we're expecting to see in the east of the country soon? Well, it makes it administratively easier to get the weapons, uh, to pay for the weapons and get them, uh, get them Ukraine. But uh, we need to make a much better effort to get large volumes of the most important defensive weapons Ukraine needs. That is anti-tank weapons and ground-to-air anti-aircraft weapons, as well as ammunition, small arms, and so on. And the reason for this is that the Russians are going to renew their attack in the east and the attack will be led by artillery bombard bombardments uh, and then tanks. And unless the Ukrainians can defeat the tanks uh, down in the east and in the south, they're going to have a difficult time defending themselves. We need to make a much better effort to get large volumes of these weapons to the Ukrainian army in the east. And, Colonel, it's actually expected to get bad enough in the east, in fact, that yesterday Ukraine's deputy prime minister told citizens living there to leave as soon as possible. When do you think we might see this begin, and what are you most concerned about, about this, this sort of lingering Russian offensive in the east? Well, we have a, uh, all of us uh, in the west have a very good view of what's happening through satellites. Mm -hmm. And as the Russian forces... Uh, go into assembly areas and then mass in these assembly areas preparatory to conducting an attack. Uh, we will be able to see it and transmit that uh, to the Ukrainians. A large volume of the intelligence the Ukrainians are getting obviously is coming from the West, particularly the United States and Great Britain. So uh, the Russians will telegraph their uh, the, the, their intention to attack just by their massing. Um, and at that time, the Ukrainians need to start pounding uh, the, the Russians in their assembly areas with artillery. Unfortunately, the Ukrainians have insufficient amounts of artillery, and that's one of the things we're trying to get to the Ukrainians through the Lend-Lease program. Savannah. All right. Colonel Jack Jacobs, as always, thanks for your expertise this morning. You're welcome. The next Supreme Court justice could be confirmed by this afternoon. Late last night, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced that the Senate has reached an agreement to hold a confirmation vote for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson this afternoon. The vote to end debate on the nomination is set for 1145 a.m. Eastern, followed by the final confirmation vote around 145 p.m. Once confirmed, Judge Jackson would become the first black woman to sit on the nation's highest court. It will be a joyous day. Joyous for the Senate, joyous for the Supreme Court, joyous for America. While we still have a long way to go, America tomorrow will take a giant step to becoming a more perfect nation. The Senate is expected to confirm Judge Jackson's nomination. Three Republican senators, Susan Collins, Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski, have already announced they will vote for Jackson's nomination, ensuring a bipartisan vote. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now with the latest on this. So, Leanne, what can we expect today and are there any senators you're still keeping an eye on? Good morning, Joe. There actually aren't any senators we're still keeping an eye on because there was a vote earlier this week to discharge Judge Jackson's nomination out of the committee process. And so all the senators had to vote on that. And so that is when we found out that Senator Lisa Murkowski, Senator Mitt Romney, two more Republicans were going to vote for her. So everyone is already on the record. Of course, people could shift their votes, but that's not really expected. So this is going to be a bipartisan nomination. Three Republicans will join all Democrats. And uh, Judge Jackson will uh, be confirmed in what is considered a very historic nomination, Joe. Yeah, Leanne. And then what happens after that? How soon could it be before she does take her seat on the Supreme Court? 
Well, the person she's replacing, Justice Breyer, has indicated that he's going to finish out the Supreme Court's term, which usually ends in June or July. And so she won't start until the Supreme Court uh, starts again at, at the in the fall. Uh, so Judge Jackson has the hard work is behind her now. Now she has going to have a little bit of a honeymoon period, enjoy her time as uh, upcoming Supreme Court justice. And also, this will be the first time not only that a black woman will sit on the court, but this will also be the first time that the court in its entire history will be a majority of women, Joe. And finally, while we have you, Leanne, let's quickly turn to the January 6th committee. We know that the House voted to refer two former Trump aides, Peter Navarro and Dan Scavino, to the Justice Department for criminal contempt of Congress. Both have ignored subpoenas from the committee. So what happens next and what are the odds that the DOJ does pursue charges here? Yeah, just two Republicans joined all Democrats. Of course, those two Republicans were the two Republicans on the January 6th Select Committee, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. And so Scavino and Navarro's referrals go to the Justice Department, like you said, joins Steve Bannon's and Mark Meadows as well. Um, and they're going to have to wait, see what the Justice Department does with it. The Justice Department is going to examine the case. Uh, they have indicted Steve Bannon. They have not yet acted on Mark Meadows. And so the Justice Department process is relatively slow. Members of Congress are pressuring the Justice Department to act or else these contempt uh, referrals don't mean a lot. But there's a really interesting point here too. Because they referred to the Justice Department for contempt, it does not compel them to comply with the January 6th Select Committee and their information request. And so while this process, that's why the committee thinks it is so important for the Justice Department to act or else there's incentive for people not to cooperate, Joe. All right, Leanne Caldwell, Leanne, thanks so much. The Minneapolis police officer who shot and killed Amir Locke while serving while conducting a no knock warrant will not face criminal charges. Here's NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer with the details. After police quietly unlocked this Minneapolis apartment, then startled and killed Amir Locke, who was under a blanket, sleeping on a couch and reached for his gun. The officer who fired his weapon, Mark Hanneman, will face no criminal charges. To charge a case like this would simply be wrong. After a two-month review and now the promised release of all body cameras, including Hanneman's, investigators say the officer followed the law after video shows Locke holding his registered gun aimed toward Hanneman, though his finger was not on the trigger. Hanneman told investigators, I felt if I did not use deadly force, I would likely be killed. It would be unethical for us to file charges in a case in which we know that we will not be able to prevail. As protest erupted after the shooting, police came under intense scrutiny for killing the 22-year-old, who was not a suspect in their case, while executing a no-knock warrant, a practice now banned in the city. This is not over. You may have been found not guilty, but in the eyes of me, being the mother who I am, you are guilty. Calling his killing an execution, Locke's family, who is still pursuing a civil case, says what happened is just another police cover-up. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. The officer involved in the case returned to active duty on February 28th, but is no longer on the SWAT team. Time to get a check on your morning news now, weather. Which means now it's time for Bill Cairns to join us. Hi, Bill. Good morning. Yeah, hey, good morning. Just a ridiculous amount of severe weather again yesterday in the same spots in Georgia. And just day after day, we're just showing you these pictures of these destroyed homes and these lives that are just turned upside down. This time, once again, it was in Georgia. And we were in areas, look at I me, mean, look at the damage. Look at those trees all thrown in different directions. That's the difference between straight line winds and a tornado. Tornadoes just throw things in all different directions. Straight line winds, all those trees would lay the same way. And you could see all just the roof damage, the shingle damage there. This was all in Georgia. And a lot of the areas that were hit were Brian, Twigs, Dooley counties, 
Well, the city of Macon did have some significant damage, too. Uh, and Georgia Governor Brian Kemp did declare a state of emergency yesterday in Georgia for obvious reasons. So let's recap. I mean, this has been an unbelievable start to the tornado season. We've had three outbreaks in three weeks. So this is going back to the middle of March outbreak. This was March 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, 113 tornadoes. Then last week, we had 92 tornado reports. Notice Louisiana targeted Mississippi, Alabama, the panhandle of Florida. And then this outbreak that we're just finished was 62 tornado reports, and it was mostly in areas of Mississippi, especially Georgia and South Carolina. So when we add all of these up, I mean, look at the swath of the outbreaks, the three of them in the last three weeks, 267 tornado reports. Mississippi hit the hardest, and Texas right behind, then Alabama and Georgia. An incredible start to our tornado season, not a start that we want. So where are we today? That storm system is now exiting the coast of Florida. We still have one area of severe storms just south of Jacksonville, down towards Daytona Beach. So we'll continue to watch that. Chances of isolated severe storms in central Florida today from Daytona Beach southwards down through Orlando, the I-4 corridor to Tampa, to Sarasota, to Fort Myers. And then eastern North Carolina will also get some strong storms. It's a pretty wild weather map today. Heavy rain in the northeast this afternoon. It's cold and even some snow in Minneapolis. And guys, take a look at Los Angeles. That is not a misprint today. Wow. 97 degrees, a record oh high easily. Wow, wow, my goodness. All right, thank you, Bill. Appreciate Thanks, it. Bill. Coming up on Morning News Now, back on the links and, quote, ready to win. Yeah, golf legend Tiger Woods teeing off today at the Masters in his first big tournament since a devastating car crash last year. We'll take you to Augusta for all the excitement. Welcome back. More of our coverage on the war in Ukraine coming up, including the impact it's having on businesses owned by Russian Americans. But first, here are some of the other stories making news this morning right now. The first major golf tournament of the year gets underway this morning with the Masters at Augusta National, where a legend, you might have heard of him, is making a comeback for the ages. Tiger Woods, yep, sure you've heard of him, is set to make his return to the Lynx, teeing off at a major for the first time since last year's car crash in California. NBC News correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from Augusta, Georgia, where all the action is taking place. Hey, Jay, good morning. So just tell us what the mood is like where you are right now. What's the level of excitement this morning? Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Well, here outside of Augusta National, there is excitement, and it's been building throughout the week. We're still a good ways away from teeing off here, and we're already seeing crowds start to gather and make their way inside. Look, this is something that we didn't think would happen, and Tiger himself said he was really not sure it would happen as much as a year ago. He's made his way back. You're looking down Magnolia Lane here at the famed Augusta National Golf Course, and he's trying to win his sixth major here. I mean, his sixth Masters here, his 19th major, and it's a long shot. Vegas putting the odds at 50 to 1, uh, but, but he's here and says that he is ready uh, to compete, something that a lot of people, even his doctors, thought might not be possible after yeah. that crash. So, Jay, you mentioned the Vegas odds there. <laughs> I, I think Tiger has different odds on his mind, doesn't he? I mean, what's he saying about all this and his expectations <laughs> after all this? <laughs> Joe, he says that he wouldn't play if he didn't think he could win. And that, that's mm. kind of the mentality, right, that, that made him uh, able to come back, made him a champion, uh, made him one of the greatest golfers of all time, and, and gave him the ability to work his way through what he has described as a grueling process to get back here. Three months, he says, in a hospital bed, then moving to a wheelchair and crutches, several surgeries to insert pins, plates, and rods in that right leg. He's practiced a lot, but as, uh, as uh, late as three and a half months ago, uh, during an exhibition tournament with his son, he said he was in no position to play on the PGA Tour, and now he is back. And, and yeah, Joe, as you said, he expects to do really well here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you mentioned this grueling recovery process. I mean, just put in context how incredible it is that yeah. he is able to do this and what it really means for the game of golf for this whole weekend, the interest it brings to this weekend. What, what does it mean just for the game of golf in general? Well, I, th I think it, it's a, such a boost for the game of golf. You know, the doctors at one point considered amputation. That's how serious this injury was. So thinking about playing wasn't a big deal. It was thinking about walking for Tiger mm -hmm. Woods uh, in the beginning. 
For golf, I guess you can measure it like this. The aftermarket sales for tickets are up 20 (laughs) percent and have built throughout the week since Tiger first came to practice and then decided to play a one day batch just to get inside Augusta National for one day here is uh, selling at more than fifteen hundred dollars. And that price is growing now, Joe Savannah. I know that's just pocket change for you guys. So (laughs) after the show, hop on the jet. Uh, get down here and, and we'll take a look. At, yeah, maybe on we'll the way we'll buy a seat does. on one of those rockets and then head right, over right, there. Right, yeah, yeah. We, the, the private jet that. is the challenge yeah, of getting down yeah. there. I mean, we just can't get one on so short notice. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's why we'll use a spaceship. That's right. We can afford yeah. that quarter of a million dollars. Jay, thank you so much. Great to see you. Have fun. <laughs> All right, time to get a check on what's making news around the world this morning. Janice Mackey Frayer joins us from Beijing. Hey, Janice, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Eastern Australia is getting pummeled with torrential downpours, with Sydney getting a month's worth of rain overnight. Now, some areas have had to be evacuated. Authorities are warning that other people may need to leave their homes as water is rushing through streets and roads, taking down power lines and trees. All of that debris making flood water more dangerous. Towns all along the coast have been told to be on alert for heavy rain for at least the next 24 hours. A Turkish court has ruled that the trial in absentia of 26 suspects accused in the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi can be transferred to Saudi Arabia, a move that many people say will effectively end the case. Khashoggi was murdered at the Saudi consulate in 2018 with allegations stretching to the highest levels of power in the kingdom, allegations that have been denied. Human rights groups are protesting the court's decision and Khashoggi's fiance is saying she will appeal. And finally, the shirt worn by soccer legend Diego Maradona during the 1986 World Cup qualifying match against England, the hand of God match, the goal of the century match. Well, that shirt is up for auction. Until now, the iconic blue jersey has been in a museum. It actually belongs to English midfielder Steve Hodge, who swapped shirts with Maradona after Argentina uh, Argentina won that match back in 86. Good foresight, Steve. Sotheby's figures that the shirt is going to fetch more than four million pounds at auction. That's five point two million dollars add it to so the list of right and suddenly buy. those masters tickets sound affordable <laughs> so there you go all right thank you janice <laughs> janice thanks coming up a long way from home dozens of young refugees rescued from afghanistan now resettling in the u.s i'll take you to one school that's working to help them adjust to their new lives and war and hate more on the impacts of the war in ukraine as russian-owned businesses here in america face vandalism and violent threats that's next at morning news now Welcome back. Thousands of families were airlifted out of Afghanistan last summer and have been living at Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. Now, many of those families are being resettled in Milwaukee, including children who don't speak English. That's where the International Newcomer Center comes in. It's a first stop for refugee children from all over the world. It's a unique program, and I got a look inside at the crash course in American culture. Do you like coming to school here? Yeah. Yeah? Number two is you. Mersal, come on up. Mersal fled Afghanistan with her family last September after the fall of Kabul. How long have you been going to school here? 25 days. 25 days, that's it. You know all your letters. Now, she and her brothers are some of the newest students at the International Newcomer Center, a first stop for refugee children in Milwaukee. This is a happy place? Yes. Yes? This school year, we have students from Afghanistan, uh, two students who are um, native to Myanmar. We have a student from Senegal. We have one family from Malawi. We have quite a few families from Tanzania and Zambia, whose families were from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. M-I-T-M-E-T-B-I-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-T-B-E-
The program's for kids in fourth through eighth grade. It started about a decade ago when an influx of refugees from Myanmar arrived. And over time, it's turned into a crash course on how to live in America. So we teach them really how to be in school. We teach them about, you know, American culture. And we've learned in other cultures it's a sign of respect to, you know, look down if you're speaking to an elder. But eye contact in, you know, in our culture is a pretty big thing to show respect. Um, just those greetings, if someone says thank you, to reply with you're welcome. Um, etiquette in class, personal hygiene, it's different in various cultures. Knowledge, education, and wisdom. When you have it, no one can take away from you. And one day one of them could be the principal. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Every day I go through the class and talk to the kid, hey, I was used to be like you mm -hmm. when I came to this country and I escaped Laos with my sister, my older sister and her two kids and her husband on Sunday afternoon to Thailand. And we so lucky that if the communist guards see us, we will be killed right there in the Mekong River. So we end up in Milwaukee on September 29, 1983. And in the 10 years since he helped start the Newcomer Center, he's found nothing brings these students together like soccer. So every country in the world playing soccer. <laughs> so soccer, it's, even though they don't speak English and they know how to play soccer. In here, thousands of miles away from the conflicts they fled, these kids get to just be kids. We had various um, ethnic and religious minorities out of Myanmar. Back in their home country, they definitely were not going to be in the same space. And just through a lot of activities and conversations, I mean, some of those students now are close friends in college, living together. So it's just a lot of care, a lot of empathy. Um, and showing them that you were really all here learning. And it's the connections made here that bring some back. I just graduated with my education uh, degree. I have a lot of good memories in here. That's why I want to come back and make a difference, you know, in other people's lives and come and uh, be a part of the community. And when you first came to this school, you didn't know any English? No English. I don't understand what they're saying. I was just sitting there and looking around and feeling, you know, very um, scared and nervous. But the teachers are very caring. She was in my first class when I taught here. She was an eighth grader uh, my first year at this school. And they are making differences in other people's lives. Ugh. So I'm just very thankful for them. So you heard Mersal there and her brothers who fled Kabul have only been there for a little bit less than a month. And the principal actually told us right before we came, I'm so happy you're coming now because just about a week ago in soccer, when we were playing soccer, is when they really started to open up. They were so talkative. They were so oh, fantastic. And actually other school districts are calling that principal to ask, how do we do what you do? Because it really is one of the only programs like this in the country. I love how they figured out soccer is like the thread that can sort of tie them together and, yeah. and help them open up. And I also like just saying that... that uh, you can't take this away from them now, mm. what they've learned. Mm -hmm. That's great. Absolutely. Very yeah, it's cool. really cool. And so such a step up from uh, just uh, English. You know, they're not just teaching them the language. It's right. a full cultural experience, and they really take care to learn the culture that they came from as well, which is really sweet. Very cool. Thank yeah. you for sharing that yeah. story with us. Absolutely. Now, Russian businesses in New York City are facing a new wave of anti-Russian sentiment. Hate calls, vandalism, even violent threats. They say it's skyrocketed since the war in Ukraine started. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett visited a midtown piano bar that is struggling to stay open. Russian Samovar has been serving New Yorkers traditional Russian plates for more than 35 years. But since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it says it's been struggling to fight an onslaught of anti-Russian sentiment. We've been getting a lot of uh, like hate calls, you know, people calling them I'm a female dog. So we hope your business burns to the ground, calling us fascists, calling us Nazis. And being a Misha von Schott's grandfather opened his piano bar in Manhattan when he emigrated from the then Soviet Union. Its staff is made up of immigrants from both Russia and Ukraine, many of whom still have family back home. One of our um, servers, her family is uh, stuck in Kharkiv uh, in bomb shelters for like the whole month. 
Uh, we have one of our own who's been with us for about 10 years. He was stuck in Odessa. Thankfully, he got out about two weeks ago, and most of our staff's family is still stuck there, but you know, we're doing anything and everything we can to you know, prop up business, bring, bring money in to the restaurant so we can give more to them as well. They've tried to show support for Ukraine, putting up anti-war signs and holding fundraisers for Ukrainian troops. But they say their beloved business is still being vandalized. We're the new villains. You know, this Russophobia 2.0. We had a, a sign, a flag out that one of our staff uh, drew up. It said, it's a Ukrainian flag and it had freedom across it and has been missing since Saturday. You know, it's like, why would you take that down? The collateral damage affecting business. First day after the war, we dropped about 20 reservations within less than 12 hours. Uh, business was down uh, that following Friday, 60 percent, 70 percent that following Saturday. Over in Brighton Beach, Bobby Rackman decided to change the name of his market from Taste of Russia to International Food. And other Russian-owned businesses battle similar problems. When we're seeing this type of violence and negativity towards Russian immigrants in America, how does that impact their life here? Yeah, obviously it's a very bad uh, situation, a very bad story. No one should be uh, vandalized or uh, somehow mistreated just because they come from a country that uh, has the misfortune of being ruled by a dictator uh, that is uh, waging this uh, horrific war. At least 10 states have removed Russian liquor from their shelves. In Canada, Russian pianist Alexander Malafiev had his performances canceled, and the UK's Royal Opera House canceled a planned residency by Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet. Anti-Russian sentiment has even made its way up the steps of the U.S. Capitol. Frankly, I think closing their embassy in the United States, uh, kicking every Russian student out of the United States, uh, those should all be on the table. As the war rages on, business owners like Misha are worried they'll feel the brunt of the world's growing Russophobia. We're not for war. None of our staff is for war. Most of my Russian staff and our Ukrainian staff, like the Russian staff, is embarrassed. It's governments playing war and we're left, you know, dealing with the repercussions. Our thanks to Maura Barrett for that report. Coming up, sky-high gas prices fueling a fight on Capitol Hill. Up next here on Morning News Now, the political blame game playing out in Washington as oil company executives testify before lawmakers. Stick with us. Welcome back. A hearing on Capitol Hill on those skyrocketing gas prices quickly turned into a political blame game as lawmakers gave oil company executives an earful. They then turned their attention to the Biden administration's energy policies. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is in Washington with more on that back and forth. It is one of the clearest examples of the higher costs we've seen on just about everything for several months now, feeding that record inflation. And while individual oil companies don't set the cost for a gallon of gas, that did not stop lawmakers from slamming the industry in a hearing that quickly devolved into a political blame game. With a product that's helped to fuel decades-high inflation, the oil industry facing political backlash over the pain so many are feeling at the pump. Executives from six of the largest companies in the virtual hot seat at a congressional hearing Wednesday, where Democrats accuse the companies of price gouging. At a time of record profits, Big Oil is refusing to increase production to provide the American people some much-needed relief at the gas pump. Yes or no? Do higher oil prices mean higher dividends for your shareholders? Yes. But the CEOs say the cost of oil is set globally. No single company sets the price of oil or gasoline. Nearly all Shell branded retail stations in the U.S. are owned by independent operators who set their own prices in the marketplace. And with major sanctions on Russia's energy sector, the cost for crude has soared. The United States is the world's biggest oil and gas producer, and we need to keep producing in order to meet demand. The average for a gallon of gas now $4.16, a dollar twenty-nine higher than last year. Drivers in 13 states and D.C. paying even more, including California, the highest at five eighty-two a gallon. Republicans who hope to regain control of Congress in the midterms put the blame for the high prices at the president's feet. Putting mountains of red tape on every American driller, making it harder to drill. Arguing the administration's policies and efforts to wean the nation off fossil fuels are driving up costs and accusing President Biden of trying to distract from low approval ratings. 
This is not the Putin price hike. This is the Biden price hike. And it's been a steady climb since he took office. Importantly, two years ago, we saw historic low demand for gas during the pandemic. Oil company profits fell. They pulled back on drilling. Now demand is back, but oil production has not returned to those pre-pandemic levels as shareholders have demanded companies maintain profits. Though experts do believe gas prices will drop another 10 cents over the coming weeks as the U.S. and others tap their oil reserves. Back to you. All right, Tom Costello, thank you. Time now for Climate Control, our weekly look at headlines about our planet's climate. This week, a new report from the U.N. lays out the path to averting the worst consequences of climate change, saying the time to act is now or never. Yes, yeah, such an important warning. Plus, a company is turning carbon from the air into cocktails. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karen is back with <laughs> us for more on this. Bill, we'll get to that last one in a moment. But first, let's start with yes. that study from the U.N.'s climate panel. It summarizes yeah. the best thinking from researchers on how to reduce the greenhouse gases that cause climate change. And there's actually some good news in there, right? Yeah, barely. I mean, it was, if you saw the headlines this week, it was a pretty yeah. dire report and so many negatives because we're still emitting more and more every single year. So we haven't even started, <sighs> stopped the curve yet. So if you dig into the numbers, though, there was a couple positives that they said. And the one positive was the cost of renewable energies continue to plummet. And this is important. We live in a capitalistic society. We need the renewables to be cheaper than the fossil fuels, and then more people will use them. It's a simple equation. So what they were saying was that that solar is now 85% cheaper than it was just back in 2010. Wind is now 55% cheaper back to 2010. And a very important thing for anyone looking for new vehicles, the price of the car batteries are also getting lower. And so, you know, building new wind and solar is the most impactful in the cheapest way, the IPC report said, to keeping that, you know, we're still trying to at least it theoretically below that 1.5 degree Celsius barrier. They said that this is the best way to do it. it it's almost too late for the 1.5. Soon we're probably going to start talking, unfortunately, but just keeping below two degrees Celsius. Yeah. And now, so what we've just been talking about is how much carbon we're emitting. But at some point, we're also going to need to then remove carbon from the atmosphere. It seems that technology is still in its infancy, but it is drawing some serious investment. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, so let's play our game. So this is a simple <laughs> question asking game for the two of you, all right? Okay. So the, the largest carbon capture plant right now is in Iceland. How many people do you think that that's equivalent to that they remove every year? Just a wild number, a guess of the number of people. This is the largest one we have. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where to start, Bill. Don't make us look bad. What? <laughs> I, all right, I'll let you know. It's only 600 people. Okay. Uh, that's what it, that's, that's, that's the how minimal one? it is oh, right now. Wow. So the biggest one is only the equivalent of 600 people's oh. emissions for one year. So that shows you how far we have to go. So, yeah, we got to start somewhere. Wow. Um, and we need to ramp up huge. So this is Climeworks. They are now have raised the money for a $650 million plant. So they're the ones that run the biggest one, which only captures 4,000 tons. They're hoping to go up to 40,000 tons. So they're looking to go times 10. So, yes, it would still only be 6,000 people emissions, but at least it's better than nothing. Um, and, you know, $650 million just just shows you how much money it takes for this technology. And this is a big reason why carbon capture up to this point has kind of been a failure. Yeah. Wow. wow. All right. So capturing carbon is one thing, but someone has figured out how to turn that carbon into a martini. Tell us about that. <laughs> Yeah, I think we just I think we solved climate change through eating oysters a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. now we're going to be drinking uh, martinis. So this is a uh, air company. They're actually located in Brooklyn, of all uh -huh. places. And they have found a, a way to transform CO2 into impurity free alcohol. And they make first of their kind consumer goods. And the one of them that you're seeing there is air vodka, they're calling it. Also, during the pandemic, they went and started making air hand sanitizer and air perfumes. Um, and they want to make CO2 in the future into fuel. That's one of their company's goals. And it's not just like this little niche thing. Uh, Time magazine said that just gave them the award for one of the 100 best inventions in 2020. And NASA has given this company a grant because they have a way of converting CO2 into sugar. And NASA is interested in that because of the possibility of using that technology on a flight to Mars. So, uh, mm. yeah, a company to watch. 
I yeah, know. I think I'm actually going to be heading there to do a story on them potentially and seeing the Brooklyn factory. Do you get to have the martinis cool. then? I, mean, I think I have to, right? <laughs> I think that's part of the job. <laughs> martinis have to after. Test it against, you know, <laughs> Make sure it adds up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank right. you, Bill. Appreciate Thanks, Bill. it. Cheers. All right. And coming cool. up, an emotional reunion between a family of four and the firefighters whose quick actions saved their lives. Up next, more on the harrowing rescue and the heartfelt thank you. This is Morning News Now. Finally this hour, a hero's thank you for some New Jersey firefighters who rescued a family of four from their burning apartment. Yeah, that family is now getting the chance to show their gratitude in person. NBC News senior national correspondent Tom Yamas brings us their heartwarming story. This cell phone video captures the moment firefighters in South Jersey started to rescue a family trapped as a fire burned through their third floor apartment. Just thinking about that moment brings mother Chelsea Mitchell to tears. We couldn't escape. We could not get out that door. What we saw behind that door, I knew that if we didn't get out that window, we were going to die. Inside that apartment, Chelsea, her fiance Dominic, and their two children, five-year-old Luna and three-year-old Aries. I had my hands over their faces because I didn't want them to breathe it. And I just turned and ran back towards my bedroom. I fell. I was crawling with them to the room. And when we got in the bedroom, I just put my head out the window and started screaming for help. Thankfully, help was quick to arrive. Firefighter Kevin Hall was on duty. Be and be trained to go and make sure that you do your best and you're ready because it's it's not a game. Paul and fellow firefighter Brian Lippincott teamed up on the rescue ladder that night, carrying little Aries and then Luna out of the apartment. Mom and dad quick to follow. This is why we, why we train and why we drill. So it becomes second nature. So you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking on the, you know, the, the, inner, the inner monologue. You just, you just do it. You just go. The family knows they are lucky to be alive, and this story and rescue doesn't end here. Chelsea wanted to thank those brave firefighters in person, hugging the men who saved her children. Sure, absolutely. But being at that firehouse and seeing the men who helped them took her back to that night and the realization of just how lucky they are. Just knowing how close or how close we were to losing our kids. Wow, what an amazing rescue. Our thanks to Tommy Amos for that report. Does it for this hour of morning news now? But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.